Hi, I'm Jonathan Burke, Professor of Finance at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And I'm Jules van Binsbergen, a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to one of our monthly summer episodes. Well, Jules, you know, one of the things we like to do in the summer is to think back what we did right over the year and what we could have done better. And one of the things we realized we haven't done, which you'd always wanted to do, was to ask our listeners for suggestions on things they would like to hear about. And so in particular, we would like to encourage our listeners and the executives that are listening to tell us what are the key challenges that you as a business decision maker are faced with in today's world. What we'd like you to do is go to the show notes where there'll be a link to a Google Doc where you can fill in any topic that you would like us to discuss. And the idea is, if we already are experts in the area, obviously we can address the topic, but most likely we will not be experts in the area. And what we'll do is find an expert in the area, get that expert on the show and have him or her address the topic. Yeah, so we would really like to encourage all of you to go to either the website, allelseequalpodcast.com, or the show notes, and there fill out in the link that is posted there the topics that you would like to see addressed, and then we will find a great guest to address that topic. Okay, so the topic today will be communication. It's something that Jules and I have thought about. It's obviously a very important topic in business decision-making, both communication formally and informal communication. How do you get your ideas across in an informal way in a conversation and in a formal way in a presentation? And of course, with respect to those presentations, there is already lots of good advice out there. Things like don't read from your slides when you're presenting, don't have too much information on a slide, don't have too many slides, make sure it fits in the allotted time slot and things like that. But in this episode, we don't want to spend time on that type of advice. What we wanted to do is invite an expert that could really go a level deeper somebody that could really help you get your message across more effectively. And I think we found the perfect guest for that. So our guest today is Matt Abrams, who is an expert in communication and a lecturer at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford. He's also the host of a very successful podcast called Think Fast, Talk Smart. And he has a new book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, which will be published next month. Now, what I think is interesting about Matt is much of the advice he talks about is advice that isn't particularly obvious. So with that in mind, Matt, welcome to the show. Matt, it's so nice to have you on. I am thrilled to be on your show. Okay, so Matt, I know that you have a new book. It's about business communication, which is a very important part of business, no doubt about it. Why don't you just give our listeners a short intro and what the book's about? Absolutely. And business communication is critical. I've spent the last 12 years at the business school teaching strategic communication. And one of the areas that has always been deficient in my mind is the communication that happens in the moment. You know, a lot of us know we have to plan our presentations. We have to prepare our pitches. We should set an agenda for our meetings. But if you think about it, most of our communication that happens day to day in both our professional and personal lives happens in the moment. Somebody asks us a question, we're asked to give feedback, we make a mistake and we have to fix it. That type of spontaneous communication, there hasn't been a lot of support for teaching people how to do that better. And that's what the new book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, is really all about. It's preparing people to speak in the moment when some of the most critical, most important, most connective conversations happen. So what would you say is the top mistake people make when they communicate? (laughs) That's a big question. So I think the number one issue people have when they communicate is they start from the wrong place. They start by thinking about all the things they want to say. I want you to know this, this, and this. Instead of thinking, what does my audience need to know? It's about your audience's needs. It's not about what you want. So it means we have to think about how can we make our content maximally relevant, salient and important for our audience. Because if we do that, they're going to pay more attention, they're going to care more, and they're more likely to act on what we say. So we have to be audience-centric. That by far is the number one mistake I see in communication. So Matt, I call this the professor's mistake. 
That is, we as professors know the subject exceptionally well. We've been studying it for 30 years, and yet we cannot really put ourselves in the position of somebody who has not studied it. And so we always come in at too high a level. Are there any particular rules of thumb you can use to somehow know that you're coming in on your audience at the right level? So, Jonathan, I don't know what you mean that professors make mistakes. I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> I make mistakes all the time. And believe me, I have two teenagers. They let me know for sure. So absolutely, it can be very challenging. We call this the curse of knowledge, right? We all know more about what we're speaking on often than the audiences we're speaking to. And the only antidote to the curse of knowledge is empathy, is really understanding the needs of the audience. So what I try to do in my content, I've been teaching the same content for decades, is to really meet with my students. One of the very first things we do is I have them share with me challenges they have or have had in their work lives around communication. And that refreshes and reminds me of where they're at and what knowledge and challenges they face. So my job is to adjust and adapt my content. So part of it is asking, seeking out where is your audience at? Now you can do that through a survey in advance. You can do that in the moment. There are ways of ascertaining. If you're presenting at a conference or you're on a panel, ask the moderator, ask the people who have planned the conference. They can help give you that information. Most of us, especially academic, we want to help people. We want people to learn what we feel is so important. And we have to remind ourselves that people come to us at very different places and we have to seek that out. And you're right. It is a huge mistake that people make. And it has ramifications, not just for the decisions being made and the information trying to be transferred, but it has a halo effect where people begin to think that person is too obtuse. They get in the weeds and that can have negative impact, not just on the interaction now, but in the future. So it's very incumbent on us to try to reduce this curse of knowledge that we all have. Agreed. Now, one of the things you pointed out in this context of thinking about your audience is this idea that you have to think about the cognitive ability of the audience to understand something. Obviously, you've been thinking about it for a very long time. You've had a lot of time to digest it. And now you're walking up to somebody and expecting them to have the same cognitive ability. Absolutely. So I talk about this in terms of accessibility. We need to make our content accessible to our audience. And I use that term very particularly because I don't want people to dumb things down or simplify. A lot of what we deal with in business and in our lives in general is very complex. There's nuance, there's technical detail, in some cases, scientific information, financial information. We don't want to dumb it down, but we have to find ways to make it accessible. We can use analogies and comparisons. We can tell stories. We can break it into logical, reasonable chunks. But this is predicated on exactly what you said, Jonathan. We need to understand where the audience is. Do they know a lot? Do they know a little? So that I can adjust my content accordingly. It's not just about getting the information out. It's about helping your audience to understand and ultimately do something with that information. So accessibility is really critical. So Matt, one problem that I think you describe is that people tend to overburden their audiences when they're giving them information, right? So can you explain in what context that happens? When do people overburden their audiences? And then of course, what can you do yourself to try to avoid that? Because I think before you know it, you're doing it without even realizing it, right? Absolutely. And, and we three as academics are probably certainly guilty, or at least we know colleagues who are guilty of giving way too much information all at once. So I'd say a few things. One, we have to think about pacing of the information. A lot of people, because of anxiety, because of excitement, because of limited time, they just give a lot of information all at once and we can feel overwhelmed. So we need to think about how do we build up to the information? So pacing is one. Another thing we have to think about, again, is level of knowledge. And would it be better for me to give a primer and some foundational knowledge to scaffold people so they're more receptive? Could I perhaps tell a story or use an analogy? Are there things I could ask people to do in advance of the communication through pre-reads or have them watch videos or review certain information? Again, most of us are so busy and we're so focused on what's important to us that we don't think about the way that the audience is going to receive the information. And there are things we can do before they ever meet us and hear from us. There are things we can do while we're speaking. And in fact, after the fact, we can follow up and give them more information or ask them to interact with us and ask questions. So we can do a lot to help people not feel dumped upon 
with all the information we have. Although, of course, in practice, there are some limits to what you propose, right? In other words, lots of professors ask their students to pre-read, and many of them don't. So now you come in the classroom, half the room has done the pre-readings, the other half hasn't. And now you essentially will either bore people by repeating it, or you will overburden the people if you give too much information. So the other thing that I, I was hoping you could comment on is, particularly in a business decision context, as an employee, often you're given this hard situation where somebody says, you get 10 minutes with person X. And so there's no pre-readings that you can send because they have absolutely no time to prepare in any way, and they will kick you out of their office in 10 minutes. So how are you supposed to deal with that situation? So in a classroom context, and as a leader, as a manager, there have to be consequences, right? So if you have expectations that people will do their part of the bargain, which is I'm going to make this accessible for you, but you got to do your part of the deal. And if they don't, there have to be consequences. So for example, if half my class doesn't do the work, I take the class at the level where I was expecting them to be. And that happens once or twice, and then everybody else starts to catch up. In terms of the limited timing, it's really about prioritization. What's the most important? What are the critical few things you need to get across that are relevant for that particular audience? So if I'm talking with a senior leader about an issue that's important to me, I take his or her perspective and I say, what is most important to them on this issue. And the other thing is, you know, my mother has this amazing advice. I know she did not create it, but the advice is this, tell the time, don't build the clock. A lot of us are clock builders, especially when talking to senior leaders, where we want them to understand our logic that got us to where we are. If they want to know that logic, they'll ask, tell the time, bottom line up front, be very concise and clear from their perspective. It's hard. I get it. There's no magic. You just have to really think about from their perspective and what's the most critical. I love that. Matt, if I could come back to the question of overload, are there specific things you can look for in your audience to indicate when they're not following the conversation? So there are clues and cues that you can pay attention to, but you need to be looking at more than one individual if you're speaking in front of a group. Any one individual signaling may not be as informative as patterns amongst people. So if you're presenting in front of a boardroom and there are eight or 10 people and people are looking disengaged, they're looking at their phones, they're distracted. So looking at people's nonverbal presence. I'm a big fan of trying to engage the audience. So I am always asking questions. I'm asking people to think about and give me examples. And in their answers or in the quality of their questions, I am determining if they're tracking or not. Many of us see our goal as communicating is just getting through our material. That's not helpful. If the goal is for people to actually take in your material and do something with it, you should be periodically testing and checking to see if they're tracking and their responses can be very informative. You know, I've gone down a path and then realized halfway through I've lost people. So I need to backtrack. I need to make it more relevant. I need to ask them questions, tell more stories so I can get them reconnected and re-engaged with the material. So Matt, that's my follow-up question to you. Let's say and by the way, I assume all of this also applies to one-on-one -on -one conversations. Yes. But let's say you're either in a one-on-one -on -one conversation or you're in front of an audience and it's clear to you they're not understanding what you're doing. What does it mean to backtrack? What do you do in that situation? Well, it depends on the circumstance. So power and status play a role here. So if you're the business leader, if you're the professor in the classroom, you can literally say, it looks like we're going down a path that is confusing or causing people a little trouble. Let's backtrack. So you can literally say time out, put on the brakes, let's start. Now, you have to have some level of authority, I think, to pull that off. If you are more equally balanced in terms of power status or you're uncertain, then what I like to do is I like to turn from monologue to dialogue. I like to get other people involved. So I might pause and say, let's dive deeper into this. Jules, I'm curious, where do you see this playing out in your life? Or Jonathan, have you ever had a situation like we've just discussed or where having the information we just discussed would have helped? So all of a sudden I'm pulling you in. So you're one, more cognitively engaged, but two, your responses become very informative to me and I can then make adjustments. But that's where the ability to speak spontaneously comes in. Some of us are so nervous and so uncomfortable when we're off script that doing that becomes impossible. 
It's so funny that you say that. I noticed that even on the first day of class when the students introduced themselves, I asked them to say one minute about themselves. And you can just see that before it's their turn, it's very difficult for them to listen to anybody else because they're so nervous about what they're about to say that they can't even engage meaningfully and listen to all the other people that were introduced before them. And so I actually started wondering whether the introductions are actually sensible for this reason, because they're so busy with the one minute that they need to speak that it occupies their mind too much. I think you're exactly right. And, and I'm smiling as you're asking that question, because with my last name being Abraham's A.B., I have always gone first. And so I got used to being called on to do all those things. And you're right. It's very off-putting and you're so focused on what you're saying. You're not listening. Here's what I do. When I do self-introductions, I actually have people pair up and then they introduce their partner. And I find that people are much less stressed when they're introducing somebody else than when they are introducing themselves. So I accomplish the same task, but I remove the pressure on individuals. No, and you're building bridges within the classroom, which is also a side effect that's very good. So Matt, can you tell us a little bit more about your book? We want you, when you explain it, to deal with the curse of knowledge, which means that you know way more than we do about the book and get us the main insights in there really quickly. Wow. So you're asking me to think faster and talk smarter. Thank you. Let's see if I can do this. So the origination of this book was caused by you two and people like me. The deans at the Stanford Business School came to me and said, we have a problem. These amazingly bright, smart, well-experienced students are crumbling under cold calling. When a professor cold calls them, and for those listening, that's where the professor says, what do you think? Or what's your interpretation? On the spot, our students couldn't respond in an articulate, well put together manner. So the dean said, hey, you're the communication guy. We know you do a lot of work in helping people feel more comfortable and confident speaking. Can you help us? And that was the origin of this book. So many, many years ago, I looked at research from psychology, biology, neurology, improvisation, and came up with a methodology. So the book itself, the first part is all about a six-step methodology that helps get your mindset straight and your messaging straight when you are in a spontaneous speaking situation. And then the second part of the book to really help people digest it are six very specific spontaneous speaking situations that people find challenging. Answering questions, giving feedback, making apologies, introducing people, small talk. These are things that we find challenging. So the hope of the book, as with everything I teach, tries to be very practical and tactical while based in theory to help people feel more comfortable and confident in those situations. So it started with the cold call issue and then grew into more generic spontaneous speaking. And it's all about mindset and messaging. Now, Matt, I know you have strong feelings about scripted presentations, right? Well, you've helped me explain that already, Jonathan, with this notion of cognitive load. You can think of our brains as CPUs for computers. It's not a perfect analogy, but for the case of the argument I'm about to make, it serves well. So a computer processor has only so much bandwidth, right? And the more applications and tools that you're running simultaneously, actually all of them run a little slower. They're not as efficient. Your brain in some ways works the same way. So if I create a script and memorize that script, Part of my mind while I'm communicating is comparing what I intended to say versus what I'm saying. In other words, I'm using bandwidth, precious bandwidth, to be comparing, judging, and evaluating, which means I have less to focus on what I'm actually doing. So memorizing actually makes us less likely to be fluent and more likely to forget what we want to say simply because we're taxing ourselves too much. So there are many reasons why writing out exactly what you want to say makes sense. For example, you've got a lot of detail and you want to see how it all fits. You're a non-native speaker in the language you're speaking and you want to make sure you've got the vocabulary down. There are lots of reasons to script things out, but then go one extra step, create an outline or some key talking points from that script and from that work. So you have a little more flexibility to move among your points so you're not so wedded to exactly what you're saying. What I do, and some of the people I coach, some of our colleagues love this technique. Once I create a script, I then create an outline. And from that outline, I generate a list of questions. And all I do is remind myself of those questions. I know the answers. So when I speak, when I lecture, I am simply answering unasked questions of my audience. 
And the benefit of this, the added benefit, one, less cognitive load is put on me. But second, we tend to be more conversational and engaging when we answer questions than we just go through material. So all of a sudden I'm engaging the audience more, which is certainly beneficial. So memorizing, scripting can be very dangerous and can actually bring about the very things you're trying to avoid. So with respect to those questions, what do you do with those questions? Do you just have them on a piece of paper in front of you? Do you put them on slides so that you go through them and remind yourself? Or do you memorize those questions? Of the three things you mentioned, the first two are things I'll do. I don't believe in memorizing. So, for example, if I have a slide deck, the title of my slides are simply the questions I'm going to answer. There's actually some research that says slide titles that are sentences or questions are more engaging and more remembered than just sort of phrases. So I'm helping my audience and I'm helping myself. Another thing I do is I'll have them on a note page. And when I preview and previewing what you're going to say to an audience, just like having an agenda is really important. I just say today we're going to discuss three questions and I label those questions. I put them out there. That helps me remember them because I've just spoken them. And sometimes I forget and I'll ask my audience. I'll say, hey, now that we've covered the first question, what was the second thing we were going to cover? And I make it a test of them. But in fact, they're helping me remember. So I try not to memorize because any form of memorization affects our cognitive load. So Matt, let me give you an example of a stress that I have when I'm teaching or when I'm giving a lecture, because like you, I don't memorize. It's that I will forget to say something very important. And that, of course, it takes a cognitive load because then I'm worrying about, oh, I mustn't forget to say this. So do you have any advice on how to deal with that? So depending on what it is and how critical it is, you might say, before we proceed, I want to make sure I cover this point. I'm not a big fan of saying, oh, I forgot, or I can't believe I didn't cover this, because then that takes your audience out of the flow that you're in, and now they're observing your thought process, which distracts them from paying attention. So I might just say, hey, one last thing we have to cover, or before we move on to this next thing, I want to review this in a different way. So I try to fold it in. I might make a note of it when I teach. Right now in front of me, I have a notebook. I might write something down just to remind myself. So I take the burden off of me having to keep it in mind and I I offload it and write it down knowing I can come back to it. The last thing I'll say there is your audience only knows what you tell them. They don't know what you did not tell them that you intended to. So sometimes we think this is absolutely critical, but when you reflect from the audience's perspective, maybe it's not as critical or at least as critical at this moment. So it might be that I just let it go and say, next time I'm going to catch that up or in the notes I send out afterwards. If it truly is critical, I would just go back to it without making a big deal. So when it comes to communicating an important message, right, there's a choice that as a communicator you have, which is you can try to artificially boost the importance of the message that you have by exaggerating it. Now, the question is, under what circumstances do you think you want to boost the message that way? Are there circumstances when you do or do not want to do it? Or do you think it's always bad to go for the exaggeration strategy? So you have to be very careful with how you exaggerate. First, if you exaggerate, you should do it purposefully, not just out of habit or reflex. You should be thinking, I'm going to really accentuate this here for this specific purpose. A lot of us do it just out of habit or because we think in the short term it's going to be very helpful without thinking about the long-term consequences. So it is a tool in the toolkit. It's not one I like to use a lot because it carries a lot of consequence to it and it can look like you're just trying to be effusive or kissing up, but it is a tool in the toolkit. Okay, Matt, one last question. Now that you've heard the show, What advice do you have for us about our miscommunication skills? (laughs) Well, I have always been impressed with your communication, and I really like the way you both play off of each other. I think the bigger challenge that all of us face when we have coordinated communication, as you do as co-hosts, it's how do you figure out when to step in and step up and when to step back and listen? And it's hard to do. And you do it very well, but there have been times where we can misstep. And that's the biggest challenge because you look uncoordinated. Here's where I see this happen a lot. And you might have seen it as in working in the context you do. I help a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of our students pitch, and they'll pitch with partners. And when it comes to Q&A, somebody will ask a very reasonable question and they spend 30 seconds to a minute looking at each other. You're going to, who's going to, I'm going to, right? There's this moment of coordination that ruins their credibility. If one of them would just step up and say, I'm going to take the question, or, you know, that's a better question for you. Then all of a sudden that, that issue of coordination looks well handled and bolsters credibility rather than taking away from it. Very good. 
Well, Matt, that was really fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, it was great to have you. Thank you. It was great to be back with all of you. Continued success on your podcast. And thank you for having me and letting me talk about my new book. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcasts. We love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcasts. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal Podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by University FM.